Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the New Books Network, the Science, Technology, and Society podcast. Uh, today, I'm here with Jennifer Peterson. Jennifer Peterson is Associate Professor of Communication and Director of the Graduate Certificate in Science and Technology Studies at the University of Southern California. She's uh, before arriving at, at USC, she worked at the University of Virginia, where she was an affiliate with the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. She is the former Annenberg and Wallace Annenberg Fellow in Communication at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. And today, we're going to be discussing her new book, How Machines Came to Speak, Media Technologies and Freedom of Speech, published this year by Duke University Press 2022. Uh, hello. Hi, thanks for having me. It's so great. Um, so why don't you tell us just a little bit about um, where this project came from? Why now? When did you start it? And, you know, what your thoughts are? Um, well, it had a lot of starting points, but I guess it really started in earnest back in 2014. Um, and so why now has changed since then, I think, how I think about why this is important or who will be interested in it. Um, but it really came out of looking at Supreme Court cases or court cases, it wasn't only Supreme Court cases, where the judges were trying to look at things like um, software or a hyperlink and determine whether or not these um, were covered, whether they even needed to consider the First Amendment. So they're defining these, trying to think about whether these are communication, whether these are things that we can think of as speech. And the court's trying to do communication theory in this moment. And I thought this is very interesting and found a lot of disjunctures between the way they were thinking and the way that communication theorists might think. And this got me really interested in thinking about law and how legal practitioners approach new technologies, think about um, novel forms of communication um, and determine whether or not they fit within the legal construction of speech. Right. I, I, you know, nowadays, I think it's rather common to hear in the news um, free speech applied across numerous things, um, especially now with kind of a new Supreme Court and thinking about um, the application of, of, of doctrines in ways that is definitely more flexible than, than it may have been historically. Um, it's, it's interesting that this project was started in 2014 and how it feels like it's sort of snowballed at least correlative with the news in the world. Um, and so what, when did you sort of finish the writing process? I'm, I'm curious. Um, I finished the substantial portions of the writing process in 2019. There were edits after that. And, you know, it takes a bit to finish up a book and, um, you know, uh, COVID also slowed everything down. But the substantial or the beginning of 2020 really is when the, the final bit of writing finished. Um, but I think one of the things that I've been thinking about with the book related to a lot of the conversations the political conversations around free speech that talk about the ways in which say maybe free speech has been weaponized or taken over by the right or abandoned by the left is that this kind of framing while there's some there's some truth in it and, and it does describe some, you know, very um, real political campaigns, especially since the 1960s in, in certain conservative movements, but it, it misses out another aspect of what's been going on, which is that the very terrain of what speech means has actually changed quite a bit, especially since the 1960s. And so what people are actually fighting about isn't stable. It's something that has changed. And this is one of the broader points that the book tries to get at is the way that our cultural and legal conceptions of communication and more narrowly speech are transformed by the material means of communication, media technologies, kind of mundane and ubiquitous objects that we interact with. Right, I, I mean, I think this book, at least even a couple pages into the introduction, already one comes to realize the complexities of thinking about say Twitter or Facebook as speech, which we've all kind of taken as granted as kind of being this obvious, well, of course it's speech, mm -hmm. um, without kind of acknowledging the depth of difference between like the 1960s and what speech was and the distinctiveness of, of what it is today. Um, yeah. 
and so I, I, you know, I, I think it's just rather remarkable to to focus in on that category of what of what speech is going to include and possibly not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think one of the kind of background bits of information that's really helpful to think about. There's two things. One, you know, uh, looking at legal conceptions of free speech, so interpretations of the First Amendment. And uh, legal discourse is an interesting type of technical discourse um, also, which is one of the things that I'm interested in the book. But so legally, free speech or speech and the press, which are what are guaranteed by the constitution, were very common sense in the 19th century. Nobody had to even talk about this. Everybody knew what it was. It was like the speaker on, at the podium, it was the newspaper. But in the 20th century, with the advent of lots of other means of communication, especially mass communication, we begin to see debates about what is this thing that is speech, because there are examples of, say, telling stories through the animation of still photographs, like moving pictures without words. Is this, does this count? Um, then radio really transforms the relationship between speaker and audience and, um, you know, the, the, the uh, ability of one person to address a very large group of people and a number of other things. And so we have these technologies really changing the dynamics of what it means to be a speaker. And even the, the modes or kind of forms that might be seen as speech are gestures, um, silent, you know, kind of gestures in the movie. Does that count pantomime? Um, and so all of these questions start coming up with the proliferation of different um, media, which are, you know, kind of technologies that enable us to communicate with one another in, in, in different uh, ways. And they transform these social and political relationships. Right. So, I mean, a centerpiece of this book, I mean, even from the title is, is that technology is, is not just changing the ways that we communicate, but it's, it's changing in some sense where communication is coming from, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. If we think about, um, you know, even say, maybe we'll get there later, but, you know, like modern day um, communication platforms, right? There's a sense to which maybe you or I or someone else say something there. Mm -hmm. But then there's this sense that it gets kind of wrapped up in a network or in some code or in some other choices mm -hmm. where that message is, is added. So um, maybe I'm getting ahead. Well, you know, why don't we maybe think a little bit about communication first, I, you know, and I'd, I'd love to hear kind of maybe a little bit more about your background in communication, communication theory, um, just to give people a little background on, on how we might think about speech and communicating. So um, my background, you know, I, I was trained actually in radio, television and film as it was the name of the degree, but it's media studies. So my training is in media studies and I come at uh, the project uh, from literatures in media theory, um, some STS, you know, interest in the way that um, categories, the power of drawing categories and uh, even technical standards and thinking about how that's useful for thinking about the law. Um, and um, so I've come to this with media theory, um, some STS and also an interest in the history of communication and the ways in which, and, and communication research. And uh, one of the things that I find in the book is how communication research directly and indirectly impacts law. So for example, in um, perhaps a, the most direct example is in the 1940s, in 1943, when we have a very famous um, legal case uh, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, which is about the flag salute. And it's where the Supreme Court says that, um, you know, forcing children to salute the flag is um, compelled speech. And um, this is a case uh, where it has a very interesting backstory, which I'll get to in a second. But um, the, the decision is that is written by Justice Jackson is interestingly influenced by um, communication research. Justice Jackson had worked before this with Harold Laswell and Harold Laswell students in the Department of Justice. And they had, um, where he'd been working on propaganda. So he's got a lot of work or, 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 or um, familiarity with communication research and is very interested in, 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 in the way that 
um, people are developing specific methods in order to analyze communication across different media. So um, looking at newspaper, but also radio, et cetera. And this was called symbol analysis, which became content analysis. And anyways, this is something that I think was uh, brought into this decision. But the decision, so the decision is really interesting because, um, well, this is during World War II. And these laws are passed as an attempt to foster patriotism and unity in wartime. And um, the salute that they're having, and, and the Jehovah's Witnesses don't want to do this because it's requiring them to worship a graven image, you know, the flag, and putting nation over religion, and, and they're objecting. And a lot of people in the United States are really concerned about the Jehovah's Witness and this, this rejection of flag salutes because they think it's a sign of disloyalty, and they're worried that they might be a fifth column and kind of supporters of the Nazis, which of course is so far off because the Jehovah's Witnesses in Germany are refusing to salute Hitler and being sent, you know, to concentration camps for this. Um, but there was a lot of um, a, a lot of fear and prejudice against the Jehovah's Witnesses. And only a few years prior, there had been a similar uh, case that had made its way up to the Supreme Court, where the court had said, "Oh, now this is perfectly constitutional to require people to salute the flag." So um, between that case in 1940 and 1943, there was some change in the composition of the court. Um, and when the case came up, it could have been decided as a, um, as a freedom of religion case, but the justices, you know, perhaps helmed by our, uh, Justice Jackson, he's the one who, who wrote the majority decision, decide to take it a step or a couple steps further. Um, they say, no, this is a first amendment right. And that it is, you know, that saluting the flag is an utterance, right? This gesture, this, um, and there's two different gestures involved here. The original salute, interestingly, is the Bellamy salute, which looks a lot like the fascist salute. And this is the moment where they change the flag salute to the hand over the heart. But this is a very intimate gesture, right? It's no longer this military gesture. It's an intimate gesture of putting the hand on the heart. Um, so they're saying, yeah, this is actually, this is, this is an expression, even though there's no words being used, this is a form of symbolism. So they start talking about symbolism as a form of speech and a primitive but effective means of communication. And um, so they, Justice Jackson says, this is a, one of our freedoms and um, that if that there's no way, you know, this is, case is very important as a ringing endorsement for civil liberties in wartime. And it's very famous for saying that the, one of the things the constitution says is that nobody can say what is orthodoxy in matters of political opinion. And that we are, that they can't, that the government can't tell us how to um, kind of express faith either by words or by actions. And so he starts talking about actions and attitudes as being part of what we're interested in in freedom of speech. So this is all about, is including things like gestures, the body and attitude is somewhat affectual more than older terms like opinion and things like this, which are things that the court had been more interested in in prior decades. Um, so it's this very interesting um, kind of expansion of how they're understanding expression and the things that are important in public discourse. And, um, you know, as he's talking about this and in the decision, I, you know, I feel that, that, that there's a, in terms of the specific things that he's saying in the decision, there's, there's some um, ways in which he's echoing communication research. Well, that, I mean, that's very fascinating. I think, I mean, there's a couple of really interesting you know, points in there from an STS perspective, right? I mean, you know, there's there's a fascinating point about how just ideas around communication theory may have, you know, gotten into the court's brains and, and you know, sort of, a, you know, gave them the kind of technical instrument to move forward this, you know, somewhat, you know, I, I mean, nowadays, I think we take it very much for granted. I mean, idea, right? We We take for granted that um, our actions are symbolic and are communicative. Yeah. I mean, what comes to mind is um, some of the NFL things surrounding the the um, national anthem, yes. um, which you know society most certainly took up as this is mm -hmm. obviously speech. Yeah. Um, and and so that that's that's very interesting. I also did not know about the change in the uh, in the American salute actually at that time. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating history. 
Yeah, I mean, so you, it's, it's, it's clear kind of how that kind of went through history, right? I mean, what comes to my mind is the armbands uh, in the Vietnam War. Yeah. Um, and how has that taken up as speech also? Um, so I'm, I'm curious then to, you know, how might we think about um, speech as it's moving more towards the different technologies that we're uh, facing today? So let me answer two different things that I think I hear in that question. One is um, the trajectory from um, the flag salute to the armbands, et cetera. And I think there's, there's two kind of interesting, the main thematic through lines in the legal discourse I trace. One of them is about how the boundary between speech and action is policed because typically, right, when you're thinking about the First Amendment, um, the First Amendment gives you um, freedom from regulation for thoughts, opinions, and, and some, some actions, but not all actions. Anything that's expressive is not supposed to be regulated, but conduct or physical actions generally are. That's the stuff that the government the, has a right to um, uh, regulate, to set some rules and standards because it can affect other people and a variety of other reasons. So this boundary between speech and action is this very interesting place. And in the beginning, early 20th century, um, the way that action is defined and what speech is sort of defended against tends to be bodies and the sort of um, the unruliness of the crowd and libidinal kind of action and the idea that um, we might be acting without um, cognitive reflection like that's a, that's a worry that's something that is um, wouldn't be considered speech. By the end of the 20th century, the actions that we're most often interested in are automation and and computers. So the things that are kind of we're trying to deal with what is outside is is um, mechanical, but in a 21st century way, right? It's it's the, this concern about automation rather than about um, the body. So the kind of locus of action shifts from human bodies to to machines across this 21st century. Um, and the other trajectory that I trace is um, about the importance of a speaker um, in, in the law. How important is it that there is a person or a particular location, an agent that we can assign the speech to? And that has changed quite a bit. At the beginning of the 20th century, this is kind of very important. Our models for speech are an individual on a soapbox or writing the pamphlet. And so one of the reasons that um, that film is not considered speech in 19, in 1915. There's a famous case where the court looks at silent uh, motion pictures and says, no, this, this really isn't speech. And there's a number of reasons, but one of them is that it's a mere representation of ideas that came that somebody else came up with. So, right, you might um, do a story of the news, but that was already sort of something that might have been printed somewhere else, or you might do an adaptation of a book, but the author is really someone else. So the film isn't speech, it's merely a um, kind of a copy. And um, by the end of the 20th century, we're no longer so concerned about this. I mean, we are sometimes, but there's other ways of talking about speech um, and ways that um, where speech is understood more as information or messages, and we're focused less on whether or not there's a speaker and more on artifacts themselves. And this line of reasoning and thinking has been very important in things like corporate speech, uh, campaign finance, uh, money as speech. Uh, you know, in the Citizens United decision, Justice Scalia famously says, well, it, the Constitution protects speech, not speakers. This is not a right that accrues to human beings, but a right that accrues to artifacts, um, which is a very interesting take on free speech. And um, one of the really important cases where this happens is in um, First National Bank versus Bilotti, which is one of the first corporate speech cases. And in this case, um, so a bank in Boston had wanted to create a commercial that uh, weighed in on a Massachusetts law that was about, I think, uh, tax law. And it was against, there was a, um, there was a Massachusetts law that prevented electioneering um, unless there was a, you know, with a, with a few small exceptions and the bank didn't fit within these. And so uh, the bank was not allowed to do this and they took this to court with the help of, you know, uh, organized um, 
political legal organization. And uh, it came up to the to the, the Supreme Court. And at this moment, and the lower court had said, well, this doesn't count because corporations don't have First Amendment rights. And the Supreme Court um, and you know, decision that was penned by Justice Powell says, well, this is the wrong question. The question isn't about whether corporations have speech rights. The question is whether speech itself is being infringed. Now, this framing was really, really great because there was not a majority of justices who were willing to say corporations had speech rights, but there were a majority that were willing to defend freedom of speech, at, you know, kind of as a general principle. So he got some of his more liberal uh, justices to sign on with this different kind of rationale. Um, and this has become an important touchstone. It has become later, actually, the precedent that showed that corporations did have free speech rights, uh, even though he was explicitly using a rhetoric that avoided that, that normative rationale. Uh, yeah, so I mean, what immediately you know, comes to my mind, hear, hearing this sort of fascinating shift that I, I think raises a bunch of questions, um, you know, in STS, we might, you know, mention Haraway and think about mm -hmm. how, you know, the view from nowhere. But what's interesting I'm hearing is, is this kind of shift about this artifact of the speech from nowhere. When, yeah. you know, mo most of us, I, I, I think, at least in kind of critical studies, oftentimes would just say, stop the conversation, really, at saying speech comes from a speaker, mm -hmm. you know, kind of period. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's interesting to think about how how the shift in courts, you know, went from this kind of agreed position that speakers comes speech comes from speakers, rights apply to people who speak, to well maybe we have to expand it to the artifacts. Maybe we have to consider just speech thrown out into the world and protect that little mm -hmm. bubble of speech that's that's going out. Um, and so, how do you see this trend now being applied? Uh, today is it shifting? Is it being expanded? Is it being overly well, overly done? <laughs> this is this is so interesting because right now there's like there's I'm going to say there's two, but there's more than two. Um, there's two main um, kind of ways that judges or justices can approach speech in their decisions, like whether or not something counts, um, or for First Amendment purposes, they can think about, um, is there a speaker and, you know, trying to articulate it as the expression of a particular person, or they can say, well, this is just clearly a message, it communicates, so therefore it's speech. And we tend to see in a lot of kind of corporate cases them going for the latter. So like money is speech is sort of kind of falls in that, um, well, it expresses something or it's used in these expressive ways. And um, for example, things like there's a database that was protecting um, there that had information about patients and what prescriptions they were taking. And um, there was a and I think it was some state passed a law trying to protect the privacy of mm -hmm. these patients. And the court said, no, that this was a violation of free speech. And it was complicated. There was a little bit of the pharmaceutical agencies as speakers, but there was also the sense that this was information and it wanted to be free in a sense, or it was speech and we couldn't um, kind of curtail it. So this is one direction we can go. And it is one direction that ha that, that they have gone, the court has gone in in a number of cases involving um, corporate speech, money, expanding um, free speech in these areas. Um, in contrast, right now, what we're seeing with um, really interesting cases involving new communication technology, you know, talking about Twitter and things like this, um, what we're seeing when they look at something like, say, um, a search result, um, which is the product of a search engine, but also the uh, actual web pages and the content of the web pages, the many authors out there on the internet, and also the many uh, judgments of other people who link to these pages and evaluate them in a, in a bunch of different ways, which become data points for Google's ranking system or whatever uh, search engine's ranking system. So this is really very distributed speech, right? So, but when the court looks at these, they have to date really kind of looked for a particular speaker. So they say that search results are 
our speech, um, but they are Google's speech. And that is because there are programmers who write the algorithms and Google has um, a particular set of priorities and goals. So the corporation or the people working for the corporation are kind of old fashioned authors. So it's quite interesting that in this case of arguably very distributed and really complex speech they're going back to looking for, is there a person and do they have some kind of rights? And so you have both an artificial person, Google, and the actual people working for Google as the different locations that um, a lot of legal cases are going to in order to articulate search results as speech. That's that's fascinating. Uh, that makes me think of uh, an architect, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, if an architect goes out and builds a house, is that an act of, of speech? And mm -hmm. it's and it's a it's an interesting question, especially because you know, given what we know about Google, um, you know, we know, and at least I personally kind of know what it's like to engineer software. Um, I, I I imagine it'd be very interesting to hear what those engineers have to say about whether or not they imagine themselves as saying something. Uh, yeah, I, I think if anyone took some of my code and then said, "Hey, Austin, you said that," you know, uh, that that would be rather alarming to me. Um, yeah. And, and so, I mean, how, how, how do we kind of start to, to grapple with this? I mean, I, I know in your, your book, you talk a little bit about this idea of, of, of reorientating ourselves to thinking about the subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, how do you see this kind of situation from a communication standpoint? So, and one thing that I think, I think that we're seeing this reaction right now in the courts, it's partly through an anxiety about, um, automated speech and utterances that are produced perhaps by computers and things that we see with bots and things like that. I think that there's some strong anxiety about this. I also think one reason they're going back to looking for particular subjects in a very kind of, um, I, I would say in somewhat problematically, but in an old fashioned way um, as a kind of simple heuristic here. Um, so old fashioned kind of um, speakers, um, is because they're trying to think through something very difficult. I don't know that we'll be seeing this 20 years down the line. Um, I suspect that we may see changes in how judges and justices think about speech as and talk about and reason about it and, and the way we do as well. If, um, you know, what it means to, you know, if we think about something like recommendation engines, um, and the ways in which um, our minute actions or preferences kind of become statements for other people, we, we may begin to think about speaking and what's expressive in, in ways that are a little bit less agentic and a little bit less intentional. So we may kind of have a, a change in how we think about that act of speaking to many more kind of um, accidental or uh, minute um, behaviors as speech. Uh, and we may find this changed in the law uh, that where we actually move away uh, from some of the more, um, the ways of thinking about speech that are focused on um, agents and their intentions, because we already have some of these in, in law, uh, right, this artifactual approach. But on the other hand, um, we could also, especially in law, see a very strong reaction against this and, and a narrowing down to um, intentionality and in fact to move back from some of the more, um, you know, kind of open or, or um, artifactual uh, articulations of speech. So we could see, I, I, I suspect it's gonna change a lot in the next 20, 30 years. It could go either direction. I mean, I think I see there's an opening and there's certainly something very interesting for rethinking um, uh, expression, um, uh, accountability, subjecthood in the, in the law, but you know, law is very resistant to change, especially on those very, very basic um, foundational terms. So, um, there's, there's an opportunity for interesting conversations and movement, but there's also some reason to say that that, that movement might not be great. Do you, do you think that it's important to, to, to think carefully about speech as, because protecting free speech, I mean, because there, there's kind of a different ways I think an audience could kind of mm -hmm. could think about this, right? I mean, one, one thing they might see is they might see 
someone trying to maybe narrow or alter the scope of speech. And, and that affects rights, right? I mean, like anything we mm -hmm. say about speech yeah. ultimately affects kind of what rights we have. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think about kind of balancing this, yeah. this, this concern that, that one might have that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe today we might say free speech has gone so far that it's unclear mm -hmm. really even when it's protected just because it's so yeah. expansive. Well, yeah, and, and certainly broadening the scope of free speech or speech has is something that has in a very important way been um, inclusive, that has enabled more different people with different idioms and ways of expressing themselves to have legal protection. It has been really, um, you know, broadening scope has had a lot of democratic kind of um, uh, enfranchisement effects, mm -hmm. but that's not the only thing that it's done, right? It's also been um, the broadening of the scope of speech um, has enabled uh, quite a bit of what a lot of legal scholars call First Amendment opportunism, which is the way in which um, large entities, largely corporations, not only corporations, make constitutional arguments around free speech in order to protect themselves from economic regulation. This has very little to do with politics and political discourse. This is a way of evading regulation. So uh, the First Amendment, because it is such a powerful um, uh, cultural touchstone, ideological thing, you know, we, it's, it's a core American, free speech is a core American freedom, and there's a lot of just judicial support for um, the First Amendment. So the First Amendment becomes a very powerful tool that can be gained. So expanding the scope of free speech is, it has a lot of different um, uh, beneficiaries, and it's complicated, and it's not only progressive. It is progressive, but it's not only progressive. And, and interestingly, like when we think about the ways in which, like I talked about the artifactual um, kind of approach in here, I'm borrowing artifactual from a legal scholar, um, uh, um, Besançon, I think it's uh, Roland Besançon, but I might be getting his first name wrong. Um, but this idea that speech is really information or messages uh, rather than social actions, gerunds, kind of, you know, the, the activity, it's looking at the, the, the text, the artifact, or the signal even. Um, and this move started in the 1940s as a, as a progressive thing, as a way of enfranchising audiences and not allowing, and, you know, because with the change in the political economy, of speech with the rise of radio and broadcasting so that the public sphere is dominated not by a multitude of people striking and protesting on the street corner, but it is dominated by a few large corporations, uh, television and newspapers are becoming concentrated as well. So you have a few very powerful kind of um, uh, corporate speakers and this was very worrisome to um, uh, advocates in the 1930s and 40s, and also to, to judges in the 1940s. And they were trying to figure out some way of thinking about free speech that wouldn't only grant benefits and rights to these media owners, but would also enable the large portion of the public that was structurally positioned as listeners rather than speakers. And right, the First Amendment is written for speakers. So this seems to disenfranchise everybody. And so focusing more on, on messages and the need for many messages to circulate was an indirect way of addressing the needs of the audience. There were more progressive arguments out there um, and it wasn't the most progressive one. It was a compromise one in a sense politically, but it was a way of saying like, what we need really is a diversity of messages. And that gets spun much later by a more conservative court into something else. Um, so we have something that begins as a way of enfranchising everybody and or, or, or making space within a law that's written for speakers um, in a very different speech environment and media environment to encompass a, a new public sphere that has been transformed by radio and broadcasting and the as a technology, but also as industries. And, and so the, the way that the law really changes in this moment is, is huge. And what they're trying to do is interesting, but it later on, you know, it, it, it becomes a tool for a different political project, which is something that always happens, right? This is the way of political legal change. Yes, it reminds me um, of, of an article in a German newspaper from maybe a couple of years ago from Habermas, um, where he, uh, 
he was he was commenting on social media and he he was saying that you know what the broadcast era the broadcast public sphere was characterized by everyone being listeners um but but now with social media people are becoming authors who've never been authors before and who and and for him of course you know he has a very particular notion of of speech one that's you know deeply intimate characterized by kind of a shared worldview um he, he found that very concerning and um uh, and so it's interesting to reflect on. Um, you know, my last question for you is kind of what follow-up work would you like to see? What, if someone were to write an article or, or another book responding to yours, what would you like to see? So um, there's a couple of things I'd like to see. I guess I feel like one of the things that I hope to point out in, in the book is that as we think about new technologies, but not only new technologies in the next, you know, 20 years, more, whatever, um, new free speech fights in, in the court, new cases where important political um, issues are being debated, where the, the status of new technologies or new uses of technologies are being debated, is that we really think carefully about this definition, um, uh, how the courts are defining speech, because this is something that's not well defined in um, law or legal literature. Um, speech is, this, is a term of art. It, there is a technical, it's, it doesn't mean the same thing as lay meanings of speech, but it's influenced by this. And I do hope that um, communication scholars and uh, media scholars might be able to speak to what, how we should be thinking about communication, the social dynamics, what is important to protect and what is not. Um, you know, kind of offering some normative readings or, or understandings of the communication social dynamics that would link to some of the normative concerns we're usually talking about when we think about free speech. Because um, I think this is actually a very important aspect of our, uh, of legal decisions and um, of the future. This is part of what, how free speech fights are being thought is about what is speech. And this is something that is often um, not made explicit. And um, to quote, uh, the, there's a legal scholar, James Boyle, who has this wonderful work, Shaman Software and Spleens, and there, one of the points he makes is that categories in the law, and this works like categories elsewhere, um, are places where we often um, fill in quickly or, or, or can seem to be technically or very apolitically define things is actually covering really deep moral, political, ethical work, but we don't have to give justifications for it. We don't have to rush, give reasons and, and explain it. And so it's a place where you can make judgments that you wouldn't make elsewhere if you had to defend them. So sometimes like some um, dubious propositions get made in the process of of defining categories and speech is one of these. So I think I would love for people to pay attention to this, to um, advocate in this way. I also think um, thinking about things like, um, you know, Twitter recommendation engines um, and other types of distributed speech is a very, very interesting thing. And I'd like to see um, more you know, I think that there is a wonderful burgeoning literature on this, what this does to our ideas of um, expression, agency, and um, uh, what it means to be a speaker and a listener. And uh, it's a conversation that's very lively, and um, I'm looking forward to where that goes. Well, thank you uh, so much for your time. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been discussing Jennifer Peterson's new book, How Machines Came to Speak, Media Technologies and Freedom of Speech from Duke University Press. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much.